I'm gonna have a wander through the fields and woodland today to see what I can forage for my lunch. So I'm walking on a bit of ground that's been turned over. They ran a pipeline through here. And so this is all freshly disturbed soil. Up there, there's a bit of disturbed soil that's had a little bit longer to recover. So we might find some interesting things on there. Some of the plants I'm looking for today are denizens of disturbed soil. So actually it will be of benefit to me, the fact that that soil has been turned over and new things have grown. Just stopping here is a wild radish. Bit of a sorry specimen. There was an earth bank here that had loads and loads of wild radishes on it, but they've pushed that back in to backfill the trench. And that's just the last wild radish there that's available. However, look, there are some pods there. I think we might have those. So those are radish seed pods. That will add a little bit of crunch to my lunch. Now I need to be careful because those are not radish seed pods, those are vetch seed pods. Technically kind of edible, but mildly toxic. Vetches, member of the pea family, um, tend to cause a disease called latherism, which causes wasting of the buttocks. And maybe I could tolerate that, actually I've got plenty of buttocks to waste, so, uh, but maybe not today. Yeah, some more radish pods right there. We'll have those. Now these go tough quite quickly, so these look like nice tender young ones, so we'll have those. So I've got my foraging basket, but I've also brought a couple of plastic bags for the smaller and sort of more delicate things, like these radish pods, which would potentially just fall through the gaps in the basket. So I thought it'd be interesting really just to see how much of a meal I can really actually forage, realistically. I get a lot of people on my budget challenge videos saying, hey, do a zero pounds budget challenge where you do foraging only. And that's actually quite difficult. At least it's difficult to do it for just one day or a week or whatever, for reasons which I'll get into in a moment. This is the bit that's been dug a bit further in the past. And you can see, look at all that chamomile that's come up. So chamomile, lovely plant. Very beautiful, I'm sure the bees are loving this. Although I can't see, oh yeah, there's a few around. But yeah, we could make chamomile tea potentially. I'm not sure I really want to. I'm not massively fond of it. So here's another edible. This is shepherd's purse. I've got a video about that where I tried to collect these seeds and grow them. So these little pods here, I'm just gonna taste one. These tiny heart-shaped pods, which, oops, it's just opened up. Yeah, kind of radish or rocket, something like that. More of this wild radish here. And it's interesting because you'll find white and yellow flowered specimens of it. I'm just gonna head carefully through this chamomile, trying not to trample it too much, because there's loads more of this wild radish down this side. Now this is where I might find some more of those pods, if we have a proper look. Not a lot there. Bees are enjoying the radish flowers, look at that. Little bumblebee there. There we are, there's some more radish pods there. We'll have those. Now there is of course also the radish foliage here. It's really, very really coarse, but it is technically edible. So in theory, you could pick a bunch of those radish leaves there and shred them up and eat them. I'm going to taste a little bit there. There's a nice small one there. Let's just have a little taste of that, see what it tastes like. Quite bitter. Or oh, maybe not. Ugh. Quite bitter. I suppose if we had the time, I could just pick a bunch of these radish flowers, which are also edible. Edible as in you can eat them. I'm not terribly sure you'd necessarily want to. Now in this little bit of field here, I very often see deer. We'll talk a little bit more about deer later in the video.
Small tortoise shell butterfly just went over there. Here it goes. So it's very easy to imagine when you watch me making one of these videos where I point at things and say, that's edible, this is edible, that other thing's edible, here's another edible thing. It's very easy to imagine that with sufficient knowledge that a person could just be dropped into the countryside and would survive. The reality actually is a little bit more harsh than that. Foraging knowledge is not the constraining factor in terms of survival in, well, at least in, in the UK, in Northern Europe. Because certain other factors are at play. And this is me basically making excuses in advance as to why not all of my lunch is gonna come from foraged ingredients today. So down at the other end of that cutting, yeah, it's mostly just grasses and things down here. There will be some other plants that are edible. There'll be some uh, red dead nettle, probably corn mint, a few other things. They have got these big piles of wood chips here from trees that were cut down. I was really hoping I might find morels on these piles of wood chips this year, but sadly not. There were fungi on them. They just weren't morels. Anyway, we're gonna move on. There's a very, very large hairy caterpillar, moth caterpillar there. I wonder if he's, he's alive. Let's just get him off the path. So this plant here is called Jack by the Hedges or Garlic Mustard, Aliaria petiolata. These seeds, when they're a bit more mature and dry, are edible like mustard. You can grind them up and make a kind of mustard from them. I've actually done that before. It's quite interesting. Very, very earthy, nutty flavor, but quite tasty and quite potent. The plants themselves are a little bit over for picking now, so they're a bit too far gone to pick and eat the leaves. So why is it difficult to forage a whole day's food in the UK? Well, there's a bunch of reasons for that. Firstly, seasonal availability. So, not all of the edible things that you've seen me talk about in videos are around at the same time. So for example, here's a hazel tree, but there are no hazelnuts on here. There are, well, let's see if we can find, that might be the start of the hazelnuts. There might be some small developing hazelnuts somewhere on here, but they'll be nowhere near ready yet because it's spring and the nuts will be produced in the autumn. So seasonal availability is, is one thing. So at this time of year, there's quite a lot of green vegetables around. Obviously, if you were gonna dig them up, which I can't generally because I don't have permission, there are roots most of the year round. So burdock, uh, pig nut, those sorts of things, wild carrot, maybe wild parsnip that you could dig up and would sustain you more or less any time of the year but at this time of year in spring there are very few fruits there are very few nuts there's actually not an awful lot of calories out there at least in terms of plants coastal foraging obviously would include fish and shellfish hunting obviously would include deer rabbits birds hunting's not really a thing for the general public in the uk for various reasons which are too long-winded to get into in this video but in terms of foraging wild edibles seasonal availability means you're only ever going to be picking a percentage of all of the plants that are available at any one point in time in addition to that there's local availability so different environments have different kinds of plants so that jack by the hedges plant that we looked at does indeed like growing by hedges. It likes to grow on the border of woodland and open space. Other plants like those wild radishes need disturbed soil. Some plants only grow by the coast, some plants won't grow by the coast. So local availability is a limitation on what you can actually find. And in fact, for this reason, I went out to a slightly different environ this morning before I came out on this leg of the journey and pick some wild garlic and some hogweed buds, which will also be featuring in my lunch. This plant here is wild lettuce, which is a relative of the wild ancestor of cultivated lettuce. You wouldn't think it, would you? This spiny, look at those spines on there. 
the back of that leaf. Not exactly thorns, but it's a really coarse and spiny plant. Actually mildly narcotic, I believe. Just long here, just long from the school, we've got some more of that chamomile here, and we've got some plants here that uh, are remnants of cultivation. So I'll just have a wade in here and have a look. So we've got wheat there. That is actually cultivated wheat. So presumably an ear of wheat missed the combine harvester there. Looks about the right number of seedlings to have come from one ear of wheat that just fell on the ground and broke apart. And there we've got a corn cockle, which is a very common, again, plant of disturbed soil. This is something that used to grow in cornfields before pesticides were so widely used. This would be growing amongst the corn. It's called a corn cockle. I've just seen also down there, there's borage. The blue flowers down there, that's borage. Um, that's often eaten as a herb. I'm not gonna pick any of that today. Very beautiful wild rose there. Being enjoyed by the bees. Oh, fragrance. And of course, rose petals can be used as a flavoring in desserts. Turkish Delight, for example, or Lukumi, is flavored typically with rose water, sometimes lemon, sometimes pistachio, but rose water, very possible to make rose water from wild rose petals. Again, won't be doing that today. Another time though, Coming to a bit of a kind of open area now. Now this was a cultivated field uh, three years ago. They're gonna build houses on it soon. So we'll have a little wander around in there and see what we can find. This was also a cultivated field. This one was turned over, I think only about two years ago. So there'll be different things growing here. We'll have a little wander around, see what we can find. There's a lot of wild rye. This is wild rye right here, which later in the year you could harvest the grain from that and grind it and make a kind of coarse bread. But again, we're coming back to seasonal availability. When that grain is available, other things won't be. The dark green stuff here is ragwort, which is toxic and troublesome to horses, but there are no horses in this field, so there's no need to control it here. White clover down there. We'll probably see some red clover as well. Clover flowers are edible, so we could pick a bunch of those flowers, make them into fritters or something. Here's a plant that's worth turning aside to take a look at. Goat's beard. These may look like dandelion clocks, and this is a relative of dandelions, but they're very, very much larger. And so, this is where we get a chance to actually see these seeds with their little parachutes on them. Let's get one. There we go. So those seeds will just parachute off to produce new plants. Now this plant here has a tap root which is edible. So if we, do, if we were to dig this up, it would have a long, thick, fleshy tap root that is edible. This is related to salsa feet. It's a relative of that. So this would be edible, but as I've said many times before, I don't have permission to dig up plants on this land. In, in order to dig up a wild plant in the UK, you need permission from the landowner. So, and I don't have that, so I'm not going to. But what I can do is help it spread its seeds around. I mean, it doesn't need my help, but it's fun. Huge patch of buttercups here. Buttercups are toxic. You don't want to be eating them, but they're good for the bees. And then the bees are good for the things that we care about eating. This is a dock. This is a species of dock here. These are all edible. A bit coarse and kind of bitter and uninteresting flavor though I find dock. 
for these panicles of flowers here. You could pick them off and fry them as fritters or grind them up and make a sort of, well, let's see what they taste like. Mealy, a little bit astringent. Actually, I think I will pick some of those. Right, what we've got here is a willow herb. Rose bay willow herb is probably the best example of this, which is not this plant. Rose bay willow herb or fireweed is a much taller plant with lots and lots of pink flowers. You quite often see it by railway tracks or on disturbed ground. These willow herbs, the roots of these are edible, so they've got fleshy, sugary roots. So you could dig these up, I'm not going to, and pound the roots and make a kind of paste and that would use, could be used to sweeten things. Quite a bit more of this goat's beard here, really nice to see. And some of its smaller relatives there. These flowers on the goat's beard though, none of the flowers are open here. They will tend to open quite briefly. I think they open for a few hours in the morning, get pollinated and then close up again. The other flowers that you're seeing here are from a related plant, also in the same family. And you can tell from the similarity of the seed heads actually. But again, the bees are loving them. And of course, our old friend dandelion. And the young leaves of dandelion are edible, especially if you blanch them, if you cover them up. And let them grow without light, you'll get a much sweeter, more tender leaf. These plants are quite mature now. But again, these have got big roots underneath that could be dug up and roasted. You can make a substitute for coffee out of them. I've tried it before, it's not bad. So here we go, white clover and red clover growing close together. Different species of a quite similar plant, so red clover which is actually bright pink. Named, no doubt, before the word pink entered the English language. Anyway, so how did our pre-industrial, pre-agricultural ancestors survive if foraging is not as easy as you think? Firstly, they didn't always. Starvation and malnutrition were real and present risks in pre-industrial, pre-agricultural life. And B mistook my pink shirt for a flower, I think. But yes, if you or your community didn't have enough food, there was no real safety net, you just died. But the ones that did survive did so by a number of means. Firstly, collaboration. So the, the whole local availability thing and the amount that you can forage when you walk in a day is increased if you send people out on different missions. So you send somebody out to get berries, you send somebody else out to hunt deer, you maybe send somebody else out to gather grain. And those three things, when people are task focused, will be more productive. So somebody comes home with a whole deer, other people come home with a number of baskets of berries, other people come home with bags of grain. And between them, they're able to make a more kind of balanced diet I suppose so collaboration in groups society on a small scale and to get over the seasonal availability preservation of food would play a huge part in the survival strategy so pickling things drying things processing foods and storing them down so smoking meat drying fruits and berries grinding grains and then baking them into hard tack or crisp breads those sorts of things spread the harvest, spread the wild harvest of any particular thing across a broader part of the year. Nobody was really starting from scratch. You wouldn't go out and try and forage what you were necessarily going to eat that day. You'd forage what was available. You'd eat some of it, you'd preserve some of it, but you'd also use some of your preserved stores so that you could end up having a, a more balanced meal in terms of calories and nutrition but also a bit of a more interesting diet because, you know, some of these things that I'm foraging aren't just, some of these things I'm foraging aren't just nutritious. They are things that will add flavor to the food and make it interesting to eat, make it feel like it's worthwhile eating. Anyway, gonna head into a bit of woodland now and see what we can forage in there. So yeah, back to seasonal availability, for example, there will be abundant blackberries here, but they're not ready yet. All we've got at the moment is the flowers. More hogweed there. 
Hogweed, not to be confused with giant hogweed, not the same plant. Common hogweed is edible, and the best bit is those little buds before they burst. Giant hogweed causes phytophototoxic dermatitis. You shouldn't even touch the plant. It causes basically severe sunburn when you touch it. I don't have giant hogweed around here to show you, so I only ever pick common hogweed. There's bracken there. Now some people do eat the fiddleheads of bracken, the little undeveloped curled up shoots in early spring. I have never tried that. They are supposedly toxic unless they're prepared in a particular way. People say they're okay once they're cooked, but there's still debate on whether that's actually completely non-toxic when it's cooked. Now in this area here where it's a little bit shady, the stinging nettles are a little bit further behind the rest of the world. There's a pigeon up in a tree there, see, there's a, there's a thing that could be hunted. But I don't have the equipment with me today, so I won't be doing that. Now I haven't brought my gloves, but you can pick nettles if you're careful without gloves. You just have to be decisive, like that. So I will pick a few nettles, a few nettle tops. Elderflower here. So this is an elder tree. Elderflower beautiful sort of grapey fragrance to it. Fruity, grapey sort of fragrance. So I will take one of those. I'm just going to shake the bugs off of it and take maybe a couple. And while we're here, I will check out this tree to see if there's any wood ear fungus on it, because that's the thing that grows on elder. But I can't see any on there, because that would be a, a thing to forage. And not especially nutritious, but again, it's just a way of making a forage dish a bit more interesting in total. Enormous stand of nettles here, almost as tall as I am, in fact taller than me in places there. But they've got seeds on them. Now people say you shouldn't pick nettles once they start to develop seeds, and that's probably mostly true. Once the plants mature, they increase the amount of oxalates that they have in their tissues. Oxalates are not great for you, they can cause joint problems, they can cause kidney problems, and so on. So picking nettles late in the year from mature plants, not a great idea. We're still just on the cusp really at the moment, so in the shadier places we will find some nettles that are not so far along. So I'll pick a few tops from those. There's no sign of seeds at all on any of these, they're less mature plants, just because they're growing in slightly shadier conditions. So this is interesting while we're here. Look, wild cherries, not ready to pick yet, and in all likelihood the birds will get them before we could get to them. But there's a cherry tree, so potentially you can have wild cherries. They're not doing all that great on this tree actually, so anyway. How about this? An entire field of white clover. Now it's buzzing with bumblebees. Well, bees of all kinds, including some honeybees, so somebody must be a beekeeper nearby. But more importantly, bumblebees, in fact, more importantly, a diversity of bees, which is a good thing. Yep, so I've seen three, four different species of bees so far just standing here. And you can bet, <laughs> you can bet that those bees are dancing when they get back to the hive to tell the other bees that there is copious nectar here. I can actually smell the flowers, There's the fragrance, you don't normally smell the fragrance of clover. But with it in this abundance, oh, it's actually really almost intoxicating. It's, it's almost got a kind of tropical flower smell to it. So yeah, the reality of foraging in the UK for survival is that you can't do it alone and you can't do it just for one day. You would definitely do it as part of a society or a group or a tribe or whatever, and you would do it as an ongoing process. So you'd always be surviving on a combination of what you picked that day and 
what you'd stored up and preserved, pickled, dried, salted, or otherwise processed for long-term storage. And I'm not saying the knowledge is not useful. The knowledge of what you can and can't eat is essential, in fact. So yeah, here we go. This is, uh, always gets a mention in my foraging videos. This is hemlock water dropwort. This is deadly poisonous. It has lovely, big, fleshy roots that look like parsnips. If you were to dig that up, you'd find enormous starchy roots underneath that look really tempting and they would taste ever so nice. They would taste like carrots or parsnips and uh, that would be a very enjoyable meal until you die of poisoning shortly later. Kind of a little bit depressing. A lot of the fields and woods and things near where I live have either been cut down or fenced off. So I think this is gonna be part of a playing field for the school or something. But yeah, not allowed on there anymore. And various bits of woodland and fields that we used to walk through are now being built on. Don't really know what you can do about that. Here's another plant that's edible, or at least has edible things. This is sloes, uh, blackthorn, a species of wild plum. But at this time of year, well, there are the fruits there. See the little green fruit there? A couple more there. Even when they're ripe, these are incredibly bitter. However, they have been found, or their stones have been found, in archaeological sites. So we do know that people gathered these to eat. And they are incredibly bitter and astringent, but I suppose they could have been useful in pickles and things like that. They could have been, you know, they still have some nutritive value and their acidity might have actually been useful in pickling things. If you add these things to a lacto-fermented pickle, they will lower the pH and turn it into an acidic mixture a lot quicker. And that will promote the growth of lactobacillus and pickle your other things a bit more reliably perhaps and a bit more hastily. So perhaps that's how they were used. Or it might well be that, you know, after they've been dried and stored, that they lose some of that astringency. I probably should try that sometime. So yeah, there will be blackberries later in the year. That's a blackberry blossom there. Another edible plant here, ribwort plantain. So this thing here, with these kind of strap-like leaves with longitudinal veins on them. Now I'm told, well I know the plant is edible, and I'm told that the immature flower and seed heads like that taste like mushrooms. So, well, I'm gonna pick a few of them, just a few of the nice young tender ones and we'll add them into the mix anyway so we've got a few things in the basket obviously i didn't expect to fill that basket to overflowing but let's head back to atomic shrimp hq now and see what we can make with what we picked okay there's everything i foraged this morning so we've got nettles dock flowers and plantain buds we've got hogweed buds elderflower radish pods and wild garlic seeds there's not going to be enough here to provide sustenance for a meal, so I am going to have to add some things from the kitchen here. I think I'm probably going to add noodles, I might add some oats, and maybe an egg as well. We've already discussed about how difficult it is actually to forage for a day and get sustenance. So let's get over that whole idea of me being able to forage enough food to keep me going for a day. We're not trying to do that. The other thing is we're not going to try to create a kind of... Uh, Iron Age cooking experiment here. This is just going to be me making something with these in my modern kitchen. Into the food processor and I have shaken all the bugs off. I'm not going to wash all of these things because that will make them all soggy and that will defeat what I'm trying to make. Anyway, elderflowers. The hogweed buds, we'll just have the leafy tops in there as well. We'll keep the buds intact like that though. These leaves will have a kind of a parsley carrot flavour. Stinging nettles are just going to go in kind of whole, they're wilted enough. And then these dock flowers and seeds, 
I'm just going to strip the seedy bits away from the twiggy stalks. And the plantain buds will just go in whole like that. Right, I'll carry on doing that back in a moment. We're also going to have in here a sprig of marjoram from the garden and some chives. I don't really feel this is like cheating because both of these things are native wild plants. I could have foraged these if I'd gone to the right places. Anyway, but yeah, we need a bit of flavor in here anyway. So earlier in the year, of course I could use ramsons instead of chives, but the leaves are nearly over now. I will just have a few of those wild garlic seeds in there. I'm not sure they will actually blend, but if not, there'll be little textural details in there. We'll just have those in there like that. Okay, at the moment that's a kind of a dryish, grainy mixture. It smells like <laughs> freshly mown grass, but anyway. And just to get that to bind, I'm going to put in a handful of rolled oats. And I almost forgot a good pinch of salt. And that has come together, well, and plastered itself all over the inside of the food processor now. So I'm going to form that into little patties and then fry it. So this weird kind of vegetable paste stuff, hopefully those will stay together. Now I'm not quenelling these because that would make thicker patties. So I'm kind of just pressing two halves of the spoon together to get a little lenticular sort of patty which hopefully will cook through a little bit more readily than a thicker one would. I haven't got the means to deep fry things, so yeah, I'm going to feel like that. Now that these are actually frying, they smell really quite good. And actually they're holding together nicely. I'll get some more in there. I think it would have been actually quite difficult to get these to bind together without the oats. And of course, if I'd used chickpeas instead, we wouldn't be a million miles away from falafel. Right, those are done. They cooked, they're cooked through. They're a little bit brown and crispy on the outside. I'll just get them out onto some paper. They are crumbling apart a little bit, but that's not a problem. I'm just going to taste a little bit that's crumbled off the edge of one of those, just to make sure we're not barking up completely the wrong tree. Mm, that's quite nice. These wild garlic seeds, I'm going to comb them off the stalks with a fork directly into my mortar. I suppose the other way I could have done this is just bunch them all up together like that and snip. That might be better. Coarse salt and a bit of oil. And now just grind that up. Well, little taste. Oh, good. These hogweed buds I'm going to get a little trim of the stalk and cut them in half like that so you can see a lovely little developing flower bud inside like a tiny cauliflower although obviously not related so we've got a pan of water here those hogweed buds are going to go on top but first in the bottom got some soba noodles they're going to go in and by the time those noodles are cooked in seven or eight minutes the hogweed buds will be steamed and the last thing to prepare is these radish pods which i'm not going to cook at all these are going to go in completely raw i'm just going to slice them that's what they look like sliced and they're going to be as much of a garnish as anything else really while we're just waiting for everything else just going to have a look at one of these little nettle and wildflower patties so they're crispy on the outside It tastes really good, really tasty. Doing that again. Noodles are done, so I'm going to dress them in this. I don't know whether you want to call this a pesto or whether you want to call it aioli or what. It's beautiful little hogweed shoots. You can still see the flower completely intact inside of there. My weird little wildflower and nettle patties, which is quite a dark coloured meal here. There's just a few of those wild radish pods on top. So quite a weird looking meal, I'm sure you'll agree. Perhaps it's more important how it tastes. Mm. That garlic oil is amazing. 
These are really good. I will definitely make these again. They are reminiscent of falafel. Different mix of flavours, obviously. I'm just going to try one of these hogweed buds on its own. I would say that is a wild vegetable to rival asparagus. But yeah, noodles together with that nettle and wildflower patty. That's really good. And these little radish pods, just crispy. Very mild flavoured actually. Sometimes you come across one that's really peppery. Yeah, very good. Happy with that. That tasted great. I think actually those elderflowers made those fritters taste really interesting. It, they kind of gave it a background fruitiness that almost like a bit of lemon zest in there or something. But that worked really well with the other savoury ingredients. Anyway, so that was a video about the ease or difficulty of living for a day on foraged foods in the UK. It's not that simple, even if you know what you're looking for. Living off the land is not a thing that you do for a day. It's something you would do for a lifetime and as part of a community and with all kinds of other support mechanisms and processes built around it. I hope that's been interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.